Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Professor John Dewar, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of La Trobe University, and it's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet this evening and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So welcome to tonight's Ideas in Society event entitled, Does Australia Need a Charter of Human Rights? Robert Mann, La Trobe University's Emeritus Professor of Politics and Vice Chancellor's Fellow, has put together another fantastic series of debates and discussions for this year, the tenth year indeed that Rob has been presenting this Ideas in Society programme. And just a quick recap on some of this year's events so far. Um, we had Hugh White and Clive Hamilton who debated how Australia should respond to China's rise. Tim Suparmazan, Chelsea Bond, Tom Switzer and Tasneem Chopra discussed whether Australia still has a racism problem. Clementine Ford, Teela Reid and Petra Buskins discussed what types of feminism we need today. And most recently, Julian Burnside and Frank Brennan talked about refugees who come to Australia by boat. And they were joined on a Skype link from Manus Island by Kurdish writer Baruz Bushani. I'm sure you'll agree that these are all topics that are some of the most important issues facing our nation and the global community. And what stands out throughout all of those events is the extraordinary calibre of speaker that Rob has assembled. And tonight's debate is absolutely no exception on both the importance of the topic and the calibre of our speakers. So once again, we will hear from two leading Australians, and importantly, to discuss a topic on which they have genuinely different points of view, as I think you will discover. Um, the question being considered, whether Australia needs a human rights charter, is not a new one, but in many ways it's been brought sharply into focus by some recent events. If you think about issues to do with press freedom, digital surveillance of citizens, the detention of asylum seekers, or the Uluru Statement from the Heart, or the perennial arguments we hear about freedom of speech, it's clear that this issue is not going to go away. So how should we deal with these matters? Is a federally legislated Charter of Human Rights the answer? And if so, what form should it take? Now, tonight's discussants hold very different views on these questions, and it's my great pleasure to introduce them both now. Emeritus Professor Gillian Triggs was president of the Australian Human Rights Commission from 2012 to 2017. She's currently chair of Justice Connect, president of the Asian Development Bank Tribunal, and a vice chancellor's fellow at the University of Melbourne. She was recently appointed chair of the United Nations Independent Expert Panel on Abuse of Office and Harassment in UNAIDS. Professor Triggs was dean of the Faculty of Law and Chalice Professor of International Law at the University of Sydney from 2007 to 2012, to, uh, and Director of the British Institute of International Comparative Law from 2005 to 2007. She's the author of many books and papers on international law, and her most recent book was Speaking Up, published by Melbourne University Press in 2018. Professor Greg Craven has been Vice-Chancellor and President of the Australian Catholic University since 2008. He was previously Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Curtin University and Provost and Dean of Law at the University of Notre Dame, Australia. This followed an academic and a legal career where he held leadership, research and teaching positions at the University of Melbourne, where I gather he was taught by Gillian, um, <laughs> at Monash University, Curtin University and in the Victorian Parliament. Professor Craven has served on numerous public bodies and holds various fellowships, committees, and board memberships. Amongst other accolades, he's been made an officer of the Order of Australia for contributions to higher education, law, policy, and the church, and was appointed by Pope Francis as a consultor to the Holy See's Congregation for Catholic Education. Tonight's moderator is Dr. Madeleine Shiam, who is a lecturer in the La Trobe Law School. Her research examines the relationships between the global and the local, and the language and histories of international law. 
She is particularly interested in the role of international law in Australian life, and her monograph, International Law in Public Debate, will be published by Cambridge University Press next year. So the format for tonight's debate is an address to be delivered first by Professor Triggs, followed by an address by Professor Craven, and then a discussion facilitated by Madeleine, and we'll then have time for audience Q&A. So it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Shyam to get proceedings underway. Thank you. Thank you, John, and good evening, everybody. I also want to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri, that our event tonight is being held on the land of the Wurundjeri people, whose sovereignty was never ceded. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. An acknowledgement of country like the one I just gave serves as a reminder that modern Australia's refusal to address the sovereignty of the first peoples of this land is one of our great failures as a nation. And in the context of our event tonight, it is striking to me that the national indigenous consensus position on sovereignty, which is embodied in the Uluru Statement of the Heart that John mentioned, makes itself heard not through the language of human rights, but in the language of voice, treaty, and truth. And so one of the questions this raises for us tonight is about the power and the limits of human rights. And that is what our two very esteemed speakers are going to um, give us their views on this evening. Before I turn over to Gillian to begin our evening, I should mention also that not only did Gillian teach Greg, but Greg taught me. Uh, so apparently, according to Greg, that makes Gillian my academic grandmother. <laughs> And I, still, I just say hello to my students who I know, some of my, stu my current students are in the audience, so this is your academic grandfather and your oh. academic great-grandmother. Oh. <laughs> really On that note, <laughs> Gillian. Thank you very much. <laughs> I feel terribly old, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I really do congratulate uh, La, La Trobe University for putting on this series, and, and Robert Mann in particular, because the timing for this debate has been impeccable. If you've ever doubted the need for a Charter of Rights in Australia, the Banerjee decision of the High Court handed down a few days ago demonstrates why legislative protection for our common law freedoms has become a matter of national urgency. We have it from the most authoritative voice. The High Court has confirmed unanimously that Australians do not have a personal right to freedom of speech. Most Australians will be surprised to learn this, just as they're shocked to know that Australia is the only Western democracy in the world that does not have some form of legislated or constitutionally entrenched charter of rights. Some Commonwealth, state and territory laws protect human rights. But there's no single document articulating these rights in a coherent and accessible way. The High Court, of course, is technically right. The Constitution does not explicitly protect the right to freedom of speech. Rather, the High Court has implied a limited right of political communication that restricts the legislative powers of Parliament. Political, com political communication as a whole is protected, but not that of you, the individual. What better example could I have to demonstrate why it is that Australia needs a federal legislated charter of rights to protect the rights of each of us? The High Court has held that the government's right to sack Ms. Ban Banerjee for tweeting her views 9,000 times, it must be admitted, about the indefinite detention of refugees offshore, among other concerns. The court accepted that as a public servant, she was bound not to diminish the integrity and reputation of the Commonwealth Public Service, and that the discretionary sanctions should be justified as reasonable to protect our representative democracy. But it's notable that when dismissing um, Banerjee and accepting the validity of that dismissal, the High Court acknowledged that had the case arisen in Canada, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms might have provided some protection. The Supreme Court of Canada has said that a blanket ban on critical comments that fails to consider the type of work done by the public servant or their relative role and position in the government hierarchy was not justified in a free and democratic society. Any restriction, the court said, on freedom of expression of a public servant 
must not go beyond what is necessary to achieve the objective of an impartial and loyal civil service. The Supreme, the Supreme Court in Canada then has adopted a test of minimum impairment. In other words, it will always look, because of the Charter, at minimally impairing the right of the individual under the laws passed by the Canadian Parliament. A similar Charter protection in Australian law might not have saved Ms Banerjee on the facts of her case. But the impact of the High Court's decision is likely to have a chilling, if not freezing, effect on the liberty of Australian public servants to speak up fearlessly. This is especially worrying as public officials are often in the best position to know when governments have abused their powers or trampled on fundamental freedoms. The High Court decision is highly technical in Banerjee and a narrow interpretation of the law. It completely fails to look at the common law right to freedom of expression, a right that's not something that was conjured up in those heady years after the Second World War and the Universal Charter of Human Rights, but rather uh, was as ancient as the English Bill of Rights in 1689 and, of course, is reflected in Australia's treaty obligations. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights protects the right to freedom of expression, with exceptions only to protect national security and public order. If we had a Charter of Rights, these freedoms and obligations could be addressed and available to our courts to employ in litigation as a sword to protect individual freedoms. But sadly, in my view, both Parliament and our courts have failed abjectly to protect human rights in upholding numerous rights, the rights of those held in, for practical purposes, indefinite detention, stateless people, asylum seekers, tragically those with cognitive disabilities, indigenous juveniles held in adult facilities, Aboriginal deaths and custodies, domestic violence, racism in the delivery of our health services, and gender inequality are witness to what I believe has become a dysfunctional parliamentary system and disempowered courts. In addition to well-documented social problems, I think we need new laws that set out our freedoms in response to emerging issues of our digital age, elder abuse, workplace discrimination against dis disabled people, high levels of sexual assault and harassment, even in our universities, and of course, domestic violence. Well, in speaking up for a Charter of Rights, I'd like to explain more about why we need a Charter and what sort of difference it would make if we had one, but then to debunk some of the misleading counter-arguments that my very brilliant and talented um, uh, uh, debater will doubtless be raising. Um, but I thought I'd get in first because I have the privilege of coming up first. Um, well, timing, of course, is everything in life and in politics. The Banerjee decision has come in the middle of a national debate about the adequacy of the constitutional freedom of religious expression in the Israel Fuller case and threats to press freedoms posed by recent federal police raids on News Corp uh, journalist and the ABC. It's ironic, I think, more than ironic, that the government should also be prosecuting Bernard Cullery, the former Attorney General for the ACT, for espionage. His alleged offence is to provide legal advice to Witness K, who's recently pleaded guilty to releasing information about Australia's acknowledged spying activities in East Timor. Less sensational, but a serious restriction on our common law freedoms, are the laws introduced largely since 2001 to counter the threat of terrorism, that extraordinary year of the alleged throwing children overboard uh, allegation found subsequently by the Senate to be without a scintilla of evidence, the Tampa affair when the Norwegian ship's captain brought those asylum seekers, rescued them at high seas and brought them into, uh, into the Melbourne port, into Australian territorial waters, and of course later that year, just a few weeks later, the tragic loss of life in the terrorist attack on the Pentagon and the Twin Towers. But these laws were introduced to counter this conflation that the government embarked upon, conflating asylum seekers with Islam, with terrorism. And that has led to what has been coined hyper-legislation, hyper as the government has introduced more extensive and intrusive laws than are adopted by most other nations. 
The United Kingdom's Human Rights Act, for example, provided guidance to courts when rejecting similar laws in the name of national security. In the Belmarsh case, for example, the House of Lords condemned detention without trial of suspected terrorists who'd not had the benefit of a criminal trial. The court found that the detention was not rationally related to the perceived threat to national security and was illegal. And Justice Hoffman, in a memorable judgment, took the view that the real threat to the life of the nation, in the sense of a people living in accordance with its traditional laws and values, comes not from terrorism, but from laws such as these. That is the true measure of what terrorism may achieve. It's for Parliament to decide whether to give the terrorists such a victory. Well, over these years, 18 years since 2001 approximately, piece by piece, legislation has been passed by compliant federal parliaments, facilitated by oppositions, that has created an expansion of executive powers and non-compellable and non-reviewable discretions of the federal government that is unprecedented outside wartime. Examples include the power to detain unauthorized asylum seekers without charge or trial, to hold ter terror suspects for extended periods for questioning, to, to strip dual nationals of citizenship, to use metadata retention laws to diminish privacy and freedom of speech, and to pass mandatory sentencing laws that diminish the independence of the courts. There are many, many examples that one could go into, including, of course, the report of the Australian Law Reform Commission that found that over 121 laws infringe our democratic freedoms. Reversal of the burden of proof, paperless arrest laws in the Northern Territory, retrospective penal sanctions, the denial of the presumption of innocence, restrictions on environmental protests and advocacy by not-for-profit charities. And one could go on and on. But I know very well from my work at the Australian Human Rights Commission and subsequently, going through the legal provisions and bit by bit looking at the legislation to see the enormity of the intrusion on our fundamental rights, people perhaps aren't going to understand the point in the same way that they can understand the factual problems and the examples, and uh, sadly, there are many. But one that I will mention is that of, of, um, of Marlon Noble. <clears throat> and many, even in the legal profession, can hardly believe that this is true. But this was an Aboriginal man who had a cognitive disability after contracting meningitis as a child. In 2001, he was charged uh, and accused falsely of sexually assaulting two young girls, a serious, a very serious offence. The alleged victims and the mothers of these alleged victims denied the event ever occurred. But the allegation was pursued and he was found not fit to plead before a court. Under Western Australia's Mentally Impaired Defendants Act, he was held in a maximum security prison with other prisoners having never been charged or tried in Geraldton for 10 years uh, until finally the United Nations um, committee argued that the laws were contrary to international law and contrary to his rights, at least to a trial. The Human Rights Commission took the matter up, uh, and I'm pleased to say that he has not uh, been released from uh, all um, restrictions on his life, but he has been removed from maximum security. But sadly, um, that was the reality of his life. Had we a charter of rights, then litigation lawyers would have been in front of the court, arguing for fundamental rights not to be detained without charge or trial. Um, an Australian court could have stepped in to ensure, not necessarily his release if he was perceived in any way to be dangerous, but to ensure regular judicial supervision and proper treatment for a person with the cognitive disabilities that he gained. Well, many of you will be saying, well, that's all very well, but what about the common law? What happened to the common law? It's, it's ancient. Uh, it goes back to the, the uh, 13th century at least, building upon that uh, symbolic document, the Magna Carta, which I might add uh, specifically prohibits the detention of people without charge or trial by their peers. Well, the difficulty is that the common law can be um, overturned um, if the language of Parliament is clear. And that is the extraordinary phenomenon that if Parliament passes a law which is sometimes explicitly, sometimes by implication, in breach of our fundamental rights, then our courts, for the most part, 
will not overturn that legislative provision. In fact, it seems to me, the common law has now become an insubstantial spectre with very little capacity to constrain parliamentary excesses. And for that reason, I believe, we have a serious deficit in legal protection for human rights in Australia, rights that I think have been in regression now for nearly 20 years. So let's turn then to what is usually argued against a charter. Why would we not have a legislated charter of human rights? I'm not arguing for a constitutional bill of rights. Um, not because I don't think that would be a good idea, but because the chance of getting one politically is almost zero. As you know, we are, we are struggling as a nation to come to terms with the idea of constitutional recognition of our indigenous peoples. I think it will, that probably is a priority. Uh, we're very unlikely to get a constitutionally entrenched charter. But at least if we embarked on the um, first stage of a legislated charter at the federal level, then I think we could build confidence um, and national confidence in, in the way the system's going to work. Of course, you'll all be aware, particularly obviously here we are in Victoria, Victoria's had a charter uh, for many, many years. Um, uh, the ACT has also had a charter of rights, and you might be aware that Queensland has just agreed to pass a charter. So it may be uh, somewhat uh, um, uh, interestingly, in fact, that the, the move towards de uh, developing trust in a charter will actually come from the states and territories rather than from the federal government. Um, but the real question is, will a charter of rights ensure that the government intrusions on the liberties that I very briefly outlined are reasonable and proportionate to achieve a legitimate end? That is the test that the High Court will use to test the validity of federal laws by reference to human rights. I should first admit that a charter is not a panacea. Many nations have charters of human rights and abuse human rights egregiously. But under Australian law, a charter would give greater power to the courts to ensure that common law freedoms are respected. A judge could, for example, apply charter law to prohibit indefinite detention without trial of stateless persons, the mentally ill and asylum seekers ensure that juveniles are not held in, in adult facilities as a matter of great interest here in New South Wales, in Victoria, could require governments to provide adequate housing, to ensure access to medical care and social justice, protect against disproportionate counter-terrorism and surveillance laws, and respect the culture and rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, I mentioned the Victorian example. It's been extremely interesting uh, that here in, in Victoria, you'll be aware that the Charter was instrumental in ensuring that the juveniles who'd been held at Parkville, were, who were taken down to Barwin, uh, the Barwin prison, were held in an adult facility. Um, and that was challenged uh, by, the, um, by the Human Rights Law Centre, among others, here in Victoria. And their treatment, um, available on CCT footage, very, very important as a, a practical reality. CCT footage showing uh, the teenage boys being capsicum sprayed during a disturbance. And Justice John Dixon found that the use of the spray was unlawful uh, for various reasons and concluded that the limitation on the human rights imposed on these juveniles was not demonstrably justified in a substantive sense as reasonable in a free and democratic society based on human dignity, equality and freedom. That was both a compassionate judgment, uh, but one that was, for my purposes, informed by the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities. He ordered the return of the juveniles to the Parkville facility and required that they no longer be held in adult maximum security prisons. Now, at the Human Rights Commission, we tried to achieve the same result in Western Australia, uh, where, again, juveniles were being held in adult facilities, uh, but this time, uh, we failed because Western Australia has no Charter of Rights. And some of you might be surprised to know that the Convention on the Rights of the Child is not part of Australian law, and therefore it's not possible to appeal directly to that Charter to protect the primary interests of the child. One well-worn argument uh, is that were we to have a Charter, it would open the floodgates, we'd become litigious like the United States, we would be suing everybody all the time, uh, and it would be an absolute disaster. Um, well, 
the facts are very different. Uh, in Victoria, over the, the years since 2006, when a charter was introduced, only 1.6% of cases have raised a human rights issue. In the United Kingdom, under the Human Rights Act there, only 2% have. Uh, and in the ACT, since 2004, only 8% have done so. So, the floodgates argument is often used, but it's rarely demonstrated on the facts and hasn't been either internationally or in those uh, state and territory exercises in Australia. Um, but the argument that's made most frequently uh, to the Australian public is that to give judges the power to interpret freedoms under a federal charter would lead to an activist judiciary trampling on the democratic role of elected representatives. Well, to this I say nonsense. Simply, over many years in the New Zealand, Canada, the United Kingdom, France, much of Europe, judges have continued to respect the rule of law and supremacy in Parliament. The sky has not fallen in and fundamental freedoms have been protected against overreaching parliaments. In reality, judges are conservative, black little lawyers, and, and I, I think in Australia we are blessed with very high caliber judges. When they interpret the law, they do so against a history of precedent, according to the words of parliament, but with an eye to the values of a contemporary society. It is ludicrous, I suggest, that suddenly Australian judges will spring from their straitjacket of statute law and ride roughshod over the will of parliament. The fear of an activist judge is so illusory also if we adopt the so-called dialogue model, similar to that under the Victorian Charter. A court cannot declare the law to be invalid. It can only declare that the law is incompatible with charter rights and send it back to parliament to amend the offending law. In this way, the supremacy of parliament is maintained. And I think that's a very important characteristic for Australia. Other people say that, um, well, you know, uh, political issues are really for Parliament and our politicians and judicial matters are for the courts and never the twain shall meet. Well, in reality, they are uh, intertwined constantly. Political issues are resolved by passing legislation that's then interpreted and applied by the courts. Sometimes policy changes do occur in courts and the Mabo number two case is a very good example of that. The Tasmanian Dam's case on environmental protection according to international standards, and Teo's case that recognised the legitimate expectation that public officials will look at international treaties, in that case, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Clearly, the court can overturn a judicial view, but generally uh, doesn't succeed in doing so completely. But I think to consider exclusively the role of courts and the judiciary in the context of a Charter of Rights is really to misunderstand its power. The real significance lies in that it creates a benchmark in society to influence the decisions of government decision makers and the standards demanded by the community. A Charter is in fact a governmental power, uh, a check on governmental power that I believe is vital to our contemporary democracy in Australia. So in conclusion, I'd like to return to Mrs. Uh, Ms. Banerjee because I think we need some sense of proportionality. Why sack, sack a middle-level public servant for threatening the in integrity of the public service when ministers across political parties routinely make senior political appointments uh, that bypass selection processes? When parliaments pass laws to give government ever-increasing discretions that violate our, our freedoms, allowing little or no legal recourse. I suggest such government abuses at senior levels pose by far the greater threat to public office and Australia's democracy. In Australia, we do not view social justice issues through the lens of human rights. Human rights law doesn't inform our legal or political discourse, and it's often ignored and expressly overridden by parliament. Australia's relative isolation from the evolving jurisprudence of comparable countries in Europe and North America and across the Tasman in New Zealand has led to an exceptionalist approach to human rights. I suggest that a Charter of Rights for Australia will better protect the rights of all of our citizens, minorities and non-citizens, and ensure a culture of respect that underpins our democracy, freedom of speech, the right to vote and equality. The tragic story of Marlon Noble, among others, will and can be 
prevented if we have a Charter of Rights. It will also allow Australia to meet its international obligations and to resume its leadership globally and regionally as a good international citizen. Above all, Australia could return to the rule of law and to the principle of, le uh, of legality upon which our multicultural democracy is based. I believe that it's time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gillian. Greg. Thank you. I can just set my watch. I think there's someone to wave a red card at you if you're really anxious. Yes, no, I, I shall restrain myself as best I can. Um, look, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I have a very clear understanding of my role in this debate. Uh, I know what type of debate it is. Uh, I've known Gillian for a long time and I know what type of audience we're likely to attract. So, generally speaking, uh, in every debate there's a good guy and a bad guy. <laughs> now, Gillian's the good guy and I'm the bad guy. Uh, my daughter actually suggested that I wear my Darth Saab Vada suit uh, to the debate, but unfortunately uh, it was a way of the dry cleaner having blood removed from it. <laughs> so, I assure you that I understand in general terms I'm not necessarily here to persuade you. Uh, I am here to provoke you, uh, and I will do my very best. Now, that does mean, and I just say by way of warning, I will have to be a little stern with Gillian, uh, but don't worry. Uh, we like each other, we've known each other for 44 years, and I did once spend three hours trying to persuade her daughter that it was an unethical choice to follow Collingwood. <laughs> so, let me start with Gillian's party uh, charter position, uh, and let me begin with the F word. And the F word in this context is fraud. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? Uh, Gillian and the people on her side of the debate do not want a charter of rights. They do not want a dialogue model. They do not want this lovely Tea Party sort of vision where the courts advise Parliament and it goes back and Parliament has a bit of a look, uh, but the legislative will, will ultimately prevail. That's not what they want. Uh, what they want is a full Bill of Rights with judiciary overruling Parliament like the US. That's the best position. I know they want that because I read it in Gillian's book. She said, even I, a supreme optimist, would not think such a thing would get through a referendum, but I'll come back to the referendum. And, of course, we heard Gillian say it uh, again today. So, basically, when we talk Charter of Rights, what I hear is low-fat Bill of Rights on the way to the real thing with the real horror which is the direction that we really apparently would like to go. And so that's the context in which I'm talking about. This is not a debate about a Charter of Rights, it's a debate about a step on a way to the Bill of Rights, which is what we apparently really want. So I've uttered the F word. Let me utter the F word within the F word, which logically enough is also fraud. Uh, this debate is always presented as if the good guys, Gillian, you know she's wearing blue, I'm wearing black, she's obviously the good person, uh, is it's a debate between pro-rights people and anti-rights people. I'm an anti-rights person. I hate human rights. I'm really opposed to them. I'm opposed to babies and ponies as well, of course. Uh, and basically, I can remember being at a conference, the Human Rights Commission, around, not under Julia, where there were sort of young kids running around talking about rights deniers. That is when Frank Brennan was doing his choir. Apparently, I was a, a rights denier. This is slightly wrong. No sane person doesn't like human rights. Every sane person is in favour of the vindication of human rights. What we're actually arguing about is not whether we have human rights, but what system we use to vindicate them. Do we use an elected parliament which is my position, or do we use an heroic judiciary, uh, which is Gillian's position? And of course, remember, typically when you have a rights dispute, it's not the case that you've got some absolutely vicious, horrible, evil person like me who wants to annihilate some person's right. 
You've got two rights, one held by one person, one held by the other person, and you are trying to work out how the two come together. And the question, as I say, is how you do that, and critically, who does it? Now, one of the things that is very, very clear about Bill of Rights proponents, like Gillian, uh, is they don't like parliaments very much. And I think you heard that come across pretty quickly. In fact, they don't like politicians at all. Uh, and the reason they don't like politicians is because politicians are pretty practical sort of people concerned with what this thing called the electorate wants. And one of the things that also comes out, I think, from people like Gillian is, frankly, they don't like the electorate much either <laughs> because they're sort of grubby and distasteful and brutish and, in my case, short, to complete the quotation. And it really would be much better if we had an aristocratic judiciary that could restrain their baser instincts. And if that costs democracy, what's democracy between a common, law, a common room of international and constitutional lawyers? And I think that explains the huge attraction of the whole Bill of Rights debate. And John, of course, gave the game away. He said that we've been talking about a Bill of Rights forever. In fact, we've been talking about a Bill of Rights forever. Charter is the new camouflage that we talk about when we talk about Bill of Rights. It explains the huge attraction to lawyers. I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand if you're a lawyer in the room, because that would be too embarrassing. And, and if I got it wrong, it would be even more embarrassing. But lawyers love the idea of these types of uh, bills of rights, because let's face it, and I'm talking to my fellow lawyer here, my fellow lawyer there who I taught, all you fellow lawyers and law students in there, we're really not very interesting people, are we? I mean, basically what we do is we do conveyances and we incorporate companies and you go to a party and they say, what do you do? And they say, I'm a lawyer, and they very quickly move off to the accountant over there. But under Gillian's model, we become philosopher kings. We overrule Parliament. We know what's right. Why? Because we're lawyers. And we have a charter that we've written, and we're going to run the country. And you will be grateful for it, or you can get stuffed. That's why we all love it. And I mean, yeah, I've had that temptation. I'd actually like to bring Gillian back from the dark side tonight. I've been on that night. You know, I was a director of research of a parliamentary committee considering whether Victoria should have a Bill of Rights. For six months I wanted to simply because I was going to get to write it. After a year's research, I realised it was a problem. So I'll return to that, the attraction for lawyers of these things. Now, I think one of the crucial parts of the argument here, and it was very obvious in what Gillian said, is... Uh, to prove this, you've really got to prove you've got a country that's got massive human rights problems. The bigger, the better. And uh, Gillian went through a whole lot of examples of things about uh, you know, freedom of religion and detention, Aboriginal people and all of those sorts of things. And I knew that because I read Gillian's book. I read her book. I, I mean that the way academics read a book. It means you look at the index, you see if your name's not there. My name wasn't there. That means a pretty poor book. Uh, and then you sort of look for the bits that are relevant. And, and I've got to tell you that having read Gillian's book, uh, I more or less decided that I'd better migrate to Hong Kong now because Australia was just so dangerous. Uh, having heard it tonight, I've decided I'm actually going to go to Vladimir Putin's Russia because this country, you, know, you could walk out that room and by God, the police will arrest you just because you look as silly as I do. Um, it is an extraordinary exaggeration of the position of human rights in Australia. Of course Australia has human rights problems. It has about the average human rights problems of the average very strong liberal democracy. And anybody who believes that it's some sort of gulag uh, for the deprivation of human rights doesn't need a lawyer, they need a psychiatrist. I mean, I can run a test for you if you like. Um, now, please feel free to tweet this, but do it in context. Scott Morrison is a wanker who should be shot. Now, we'll wait to see when the federal police come through the door. So if some of you could tweet, 
The rest of you can do your timing. And it is actually quite funny when you read Julian's book. You know, she's, at one stage, she's saying, well, there are some good things. You know, there is the rule of law, and Parliament has passed lots of acts about human rights commissions and ombudsmen, and you know, we do have free courts. It's like that scene from the life of Brian. What have the Romans done for us? And then comes the list of the different things. And of course, then there's the ever-present attempt to say, explain why it is that countries have Bill of Rights, have the occasional problem that might be a bit difficult. Like the most famous Bill of Rights, the United States Bill of Rights, where the federal government, under that wonderful man, Donald Trump, has just decided to reintroduce capital punishment. We are not a rights school, though. We do not need the solution of a right school like we need the solution, as I say, of something that has its problems, but it can be fixed. And my view is that can be done under Parliament. Now, there's a third fraud in this debate, which is slightly technical, uh, which is this. One of the things that isn't mentioned is that the dialogue model that is being proposed by Gillian, among others, doesn't actually work constitutionally at federal level. Now, I will spare you the full horror of the explanation of this, but basically in Australia, at federal level, we have a judicial separation of powers, uh, and in a case called, and I can't even pronounce the name, I think it's something like uh, Mimilosovic, which is a case that you all love because it actually upheld the Victorian Charter. Unfortunately, a majority of the High Court, admittedly by Obiter, said that this could not possibly work uh, in Australian level, because effectively it would involve the court giving an advisory pip. So what we've really got here is we've got a dodgy product based on a false premise that doesn't even work. It sounds like buying a Volkswagen. And I think the difficulty we've got, and this is why we're in this ridiculous position where we're arguing about a Charter of Rights, which Gillian actually doesn't want, which actually can't be implemented constitutionally in Australia, to deal with a number of problems that are grossly exaggerated, is that if you wanted to actually have a Bill of Rights, you'd have to go to a referendum. And we don't want that because we'd have to ask the people. And remember, we don't like the people because they're grubby and they don't give the right answer. And the last time rights questions were put were in 1988 and they managed to get 30% of the vote. So there's no way it's ever going to get up, so really we lawyers should just do it uh, for ourselves. Now, I can tell you how easy it is to wreck this sort of debate. Remember when Frank Brennan tried to run uh, the argument for this sort of thing? Uh, I think it would be fair to say that uh, that was stopped from being put forward by the huge coalition of myself, Julian Lisa, a Liberal MP, and Bob Carr, the former Premier of New South Wales. So I have experience in this. And what that leads to is what really we're talking about is a power diversion product. Uh, we're trying to create these express rights which allow the judges enormous latitude of interpret and interpretation so that they can legislate. That is why, contrary to what we've heard, the United States Supreme Court is often called a super legislator. It can literally make law by interpreting the Bill of Rights. Now, just, just test this in your wild imagination. Uh, not asking whether you like national security, you probably like your own bit of national security, you may not be fond of the concept. Imagine the High Court, given the term equality and the effect that it would have on national security legislation. Not whether you like the effect, but what effect would it have? Huge. Imagine equality and immigration and refugees. Huge. That's what it's meant to have. That's why people were in favour of Bill of Rights Want them. You don't even need to imagine what happened with the phrase due process in the American Constitution. Originally inserted as a guarantee of procedural due process, then interpreted by the Supreme Court as a guarantee of substantive due process, through the 30s and 40s used to knock down pro-labour legislation, guaranteeing conditions for workers because you had conservative judges, and then used in the 60s from then on to say, well, of course, if you have procedural due process, you must have substantive due process, and from that must come a right of privacy, and that means there's a right to abortion, but not in the third, uh, the third trimester. And, of course, you can all see that written down there in the words due process, can't you? So that's the way these things actually work. Now, the question which Gillian posed, and I'm very happy to answer, 
uh, is why should Parliament actually decide these fundamental questions? And I mean, remember, most fundamental questions of human rights uh, are actually fundamental questions of policy. It's very good to be able to frame them as rights because you immediately get the moral high ground. Uh, I once remember saying that a human right was merely an ambit claim with a very, very good public relations agent. So here goes. Why should Parliament decide these fundamental things? Well, first of all, in principle, it's democratically elected whether you like the product or not. It's not perfect, but we elect it on the basis of universal suffrage. Whatever its deficiencies, ask yourself the question, is it comparatively democratic for the judges than the judges? And while you're asking yourself that question, ask yourself this question, who did you vote for in the last High Court election? Now, I've heard Gillian's treatise on executive dominance of Parliament. That's always an issue. But the question I ask is this. Where have you been in the last 10 years? We've had prime ministers falling like skittles, governments hanging on by single seats, massively powerful independents, and senates able to force their will upon the executive. If we were doing this debate 15 years ago, we would have a different position. But we're probably in a golden age of parliamentary responsibility. Yes, the composition of Parliament is not wide enough, but by God, it's better than the composition of the judiciary. And then there's the question of capacity. The thing with Parliaments like the Bonnot is that they can take a broad perspective across Australia. They can handle multivariant policy disputes rather than pretending that a policy dispute is a dispute between two parties. They can get wide views from wide sectors and expertise. There's this new Marvie invention called the public service that is capable of analysing policy positions. They're supported by a policy apparatus and they are used to balancing individual with collective rights, which is what is usually happening in things like national security. I actually don't want a country where individual rights figured out by lawyers automatically trump collective rights, whether they're rights to national security or the enforcement of measures to alleviate climate change. And then, of course, there's the slight embarrassment of accountability that we can actually diselect our politicians, that we can put them in and take them out, whereas the great thing about a judge uh, is like barracking for Carlton, it may be unpleasant, but you're always going to be there. Now, that's the claim of Parliament. Now, why not the judges? Well, let's do the argument of principle again. They have no democratic authority at all. They're not elected. We don't vote for them. They are, in fact, appointed by the wicked, evil, vicious, rotten, smelly executive that Gillian is so frightened of. So if you're an executive who wants a judiciary that's going to promote a particular view of human rights or anything else, you only have to be determined enough to appoint the people you want on the court and then you will be able to do it with the cover of law. And the truth, realistically, is that this is not a case where you're talking about neutral rights. It's very interesting. You know, hands up the people in this audience who are really, really, really nasty conservatives like me who want a Charter of Rights. That's right. There's none of you. Because a Charter of Rights automatically privileges a progressive agenda. So this is not a debate about a neutral position on rights. It's a debate about putting forward a particular brand of politics. As a matter of capacity, do you know what judges are good at? They're lawyers. They're good at Law. They're not good at policy. They haven't spent their time devising legislative solutions. They are not people who have been trained in the analysis of policy positions to come up with answers. They're not used to deciding policy-centric disputes between public interest and private interest. Their experience of administration is roughly confined to their secretary in their barristers' chambers. They have had no experience of support uh, apparatus and they are completely unaccountable being appointed for life and being virtually impossible to remove. These are the people to whom we are going to confide everything from national security to a public holiday uh, on the birthday of any public figure uh, you care to think. 
Now, if you want to go forward and, and look at that, um, I can see all sorts of reasons uh, why you might want this. If you were like my colleague, if you were like most of us, if you were like me in one of my bad moments when I was looking at politics, uh, it is tremendous fun to be a philosopher king. It is wonderful to know that you will be able to put your political agenda through under cover of it being a human rights position. It is terrific that you will be able to win the battle for your progressive side of politics because you are the people who have managed to get yourself into that position. And do you know what? There is actually a principled argument for this if people were prepared to be honest and put it. The problem is, it's not democracy. You're not arguing for a democracy. You are arguing a very old and well-respected argument. You want an aristocracy. An aristocracy of wise, all-knowing, all-marvellous judges who will make the decisions. I always enjoy putting that to Michael Kirby, who's a good friend, uh, because he gets very upset when I say that. Now, I'm not going to do all the furfies that Dillian wants to do. I don't think there's going to be a flood of litigation. Uh, I certainly think uh, that it is extraordinary some of the arguments that we've heard. Everybody has a Bill of Rights, so we should have one. So if everybody had a capital punishment, we should do that too. Uh, I liked the book, the, the argument in the book that we were so ignorant because we were in this little horrible spot at the bottom of the world that we hadn't been exposed enough to the sophistication of European thought uh, that we would have a Bill of Rights. Uh, courts interpret things anyway. Courts interpret things, but boy, when you've got something like equality, you've got something to interpret. Um, all of those arguments, I mean, it's quite fascinating. In, in Canada, there's actually an argument from the left against a Charter of Rights, and it has something in it. And that Charter of Rights, that argument is, it privileges middle-class individual rights, like the rights of Gillian and myself, against national collective rights that lots of people have. For the federal police come in. Right. So look, can I just conclude on this? There's, there's often a bit of a book that, that really, really does explain where someone's coming from. So in Gillian's book, and this is great, we bought it, so you know, sales should go up. You know. Usually my book sells three or four copies, so if yours or anything like that, you know, it's going up magnificently. Um, it gave an illustration, I think, of the values and the position. It was sort of towards the end of the book. And Gillian talked about the occasion where three federal ministers dared, dared to criticise the Victorian judiciary on the issue of sentencing. And they were forced to apologise under threat of contempt and penal sanctions by the Victorian Supreme Court. There was almost an erotic frisson of excitement as Gillian contemplated this. So that's apparently what it is. Sentencing, is it a public topic of free speech? Yes. Do we talk about it? Yes. Should we talk about it? Yes. And what will happen if you say something that Gillian's judges don't like? You'll go to jail and Gillian will turn the key because the judges that are so good, that's what happens. I prefer an alternative view. I remember in 1987, I gave the Deakin Lecture at Melbourne University. The topic of the lecture was a study, uh, sorry, the High Court of Australia, a study in the abuse of power. Now, I think it would be fair to say there were quite a few High Court judges who didn't like me. None of them tried to imprison me. And Michael Kirby asked if he could come over to Western Australia and give a corrective lecture to my students, which I agreed. That's our present system. <laughs> well, you might have approved sales in my book. <laughs> All right. Thank you to both of our speakers. Now um, I get a chance to ask a few questions. And then after I've asked a few questions and Gillian and Greg have given us their answers, then we get to open it up to all of you. So if you have a question bubbling away in your minds, just as we're speaking, try and bring it to the forefront of your mind and be ready to go in about 18 minutes. All right. So 
if I can boil down, perhaps, the differences that we've heard between Gillian and Greg, they seem to boil down to differences in the ideas of the role of judges and the role of parliament in our system. So if I could start with asking you both about the role of judges, and then we'll talk about parliament. So one of the, no, so this is for both of you. So one of the... Um, I say she could go first. Ah, okay. One of the criticisms that Greg made was that judges would abuse the power of being able to interpret something like equality. And I wonder then what um, you both think judges actually do all the time in their roles. So, for example, I'm thinking of a case just recently called Masson where uh, Victorian judges decided that uh, someone could be someone could be someone else's family if they were a sperm donor. So that was a judge making a determination of what family means under the Family Law Act. So my question is, and, they, and judges do this kind of work all the time in constitutional decisions, as many of you would know, if you follow uh, constitutional law nerd websites, uh, judges have made the decision that dual citizens um, because they've interpreted the Constitution in a particular way that means that dual citizens can't stand for Parliament in our society. So I guess my question is, judges are doing this anyway. Judges are practised at doing this. How is uh, a Bill of Rights or a Human Rights Charter, or whatever we call it, different? Or is it different? Well, perhaps I could begin by saying that almost everything Greg said is wrong or misinformed, <laughs> except that I am a supporter of Collingwood. Uh, but your daughter isn't. <laughs> my daughter isn't, no. <laughs> um, where, where to begin? Um, uh, firstly, uh, there are just one correction I must make, and that is that the High Court of Australia uh, uh, extraordinarily includes three women judges, uh, including a Chief Justice. We've never had that before, and, and to, to describe the High Court as not being uh, in any way representative of the, of the community is a little, a little tough. Uh, it's not representative of other groups in the community, that is true, but at least there are significant improvements in the, in the number of women uh, appointed to courts, and that's a huge improvement over my lifetime, I, I can promise you. Uh, and also, they must retire um, uh, under the Constitution at, uh, at 70, so they're not there forever. And as they're often appointed when they're getting on a bit, um, they don't actually have all that long uh, to play this extraordinary role that Greg has been describing. Now, to get back to the question, very briefly, where do you think our common law freedoms came from? Freedom of speech, freedom of association, ideas of privacy, the idea that we should not um, have detention without trial. Um, these ideas came significantly from the judges in the common law system. From about the 13th and 14th century, judges started to give substantive decisions on the law. They have always uh, included policy and contemporary values in their understanding of the law. That is how we have the common law, and it's the common law uh, that developed these fundamental principles, along with, of course, uh, the Bill of Rights uh, in, in England in, in 1689. Now, uh, I think um, uh, the point is very well made. The, some of the greatest advances in Australian legal jurisprudence have come because the courts have said it's time for recognising a, a different a, a, a view, a, a contemporary view. And the, the, uh, the courage of the then High Court of Australia in a different composition uh, to overturn terra nullius, the idea that Australia was a totally empty land with, with no uh, organisational structure amongst our Indigenous peoples, to overturn that view was a, was a view of, of, a, of a court that was taking the law to a step that the Parliament was quite incapable of taking. And we, there are many, many other examples of that. But that is not to say that our courts very often embark on, on a sort of rampage through contemporary values and pick the ones they like. That's not what the courts do. It's a careful and considered approach to evolving jurisprudence. The common law has survived as one of the, gr the greatest system of law in the world because of that ability of judges in particular to interpret in ways that reflect contemporary views. Now, they're not always right, 
and they're going to be overturned by Parliament. If the judge goes too far, Parliament can come right back in and, and declare that what they've just determined is, is inaccurate. But if I could give one very quick example, in the Teo case, uh, the, um, the Mason Court decided that uh, there must be some consideration to the primary interests of the child when considering uh, deportation issues and others. Um, now, th and that there was a legitimate expectation that officials would look at, uh, at the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, Parliament absolutely objected to that idea. And the respective governments, Liberal National Party and the Labour Party, tried to introduce a law that, f that made it illegal uh, to uh, adopt the idea of, uh, of a legitimate expectation that we would look at a basic human right. And they failed every time. And that case, while there's been some stepping back from it, still remains good law in Australian uh, jurisprudence. So Parliament sometimes can be encouraged to accept uh, that we do have to respect human rights. And indeed, if I can finally add, those common law principles that emerged from the 13th century have been picked up by great Australians like H.V. Evatt, who then went to, Gene uh, to, um, to uh, the United States to help draft uh, with the team the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Australia has been a leader in giving treaty form to these common law freedoms. And, and I think the courts should be allowed to continue that process, but they've been excluded. And, and in my view, and the reason I have that example about three politicians being required to apologise for the court for criticising the, uh, the court and its judicial determinations on, on sentencing, that the reason why I mentioned that in the last part of my book was that it illustrated that there has been a government... Um, there has been a trend towards demeaning our judges and demeaning our courts, whether it's environmental decisions or decisions about, about public sp uh, speaking. So I think my key point is judges have always contributed to the development of the law, and that is how we have the common law. And what I'm asking for is a greater ability for judges to go back to those fundamental freedoms and to interpret those provisions in a way that's consistent with individual rights. Greg. Okay. Um, when I used to debate, one of the golden rules was you always get your cheap shots in first, uh, because they're probably the ones most likely to appeal uh, to the audience. Uh, one really obvious one is one swallow does not a summer make, three women does not give a nationally diverse judiciary. Uh, that's called mathematics. Just count the number of judges and divide by that, and you'll get it. Uh, the second one is... I think, again, that's a wonderful example about the Supreme Court uh, that Professor Triggs has said. There is a tendency to demean the judges, say nasty things about them. And if you do that, you really should be guilty of a criminal offence. I mean, that is a remarkable proposition, but it's a very honest proposition, and I think it tells you uh, where we're coming from in here, in this rather lovely, rather quaint, uh, sort of Edwardian genteel uh, debate about a Bill of Rights, and I'm glad to see we've pretty well moved on to a, a Bill of Rights rather than a Charter. But I think the thing that most gave that to me was the um, rhapsodic quote about the, the, 19, uh, the 1689 uh, Bill of Rights. I remember the 1689 Bill of Rights, I wasn't there. <coughs> Uh, but it was something that's rather interesting uh, to me uh, as a Catholic. Because the 1689 Bill of Rights not only guaranteed the right to bear arms, quote, to Protestant subjects according to their condition, but also barred Catholics and dissenters from voting for Parliament, serving as officers in the army, or, and I think this will upset Julian most, being judges or lawyers. So this sort of quaint view, this quaint aristocratic view is really remarkable. Now, on the substance, I'd say this. It's one of the most common or garden arguments in the world. Judges always interpret things. Judges have interpreted the Property Act and the Criminal Law Act. So if they interpret that, what's wrong with interpreting a Bill of Rights? And there are two answers to that. One is because the sort of terms that you use in ordinary legislation are not the sort of terms that you use in a Bill of Rights. In a Bill of Rights, you use enormously broad terms like equality or freedom of speech 
or due process, not words like wombat or conveyance or dog, and it means that they are basically vessels of meaning that can be filled up by a judge in any direction they like. They are basically different. You can test it yourself. Think of the word equality in relation to a national security debate and think of what a right-minded judge would be able to do with that. Take the example I gave you about due process in the American Constitution, where it went from there to somewhere south of Fitzroy. That's not a hypothetical example of what Julian is assuring you good, like-minded, well-thinking judges will do. That is what judges actually did. That is why in America we have those dreadful Senate hearings where people are trashed and where politically appointed Supreme Courts are composed of judges selected precisely to do the bidding of whoever happens to be in power at the time because even someone as Donald Trump, dumb as Donald Trump knows, if he can get a judge and a Bill of Rights with that level of width, then Bob's his uncle and he can interpret those laws and have them interpreted the way he wants. That's the first, that's the first problem. Can the I, second, no, 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 I'll give you two. <laughs> Always good to have two. The second one is this, seeing as we're talking about a Bill of Rights, and as I say, the debate seems to have gone very much in that way, and I'm quite happy with that. The problem with the Bill of Rights, the sort of Bill of Rights Gillian wants, but will never get through a referendum, um, is that you can't overrule a judicial decision. So if the judges make a common law decision, Parliament can overrule it. If a judge makes a Bill of Rights decision under the Constitution, it is constitutional law, and it cannot be overruled, no matter what Parliament thinks. So it has no analogy at all with the common law, which, of course, if the judges get it wrong, as judges sometimes do, they can be overruled. I just wanted to make the point that I've had a great deal to do with Senate estimates and inquiries, as some people in this audience might recall, uh, and I've never seen as, uh, as unacceptable an abuse of government and executive powers and, and, and by Parliament. Um, we need a way of regulating and checking and balancing. I'm not saying that we turn the world over to lawyers. Of course I'm not. What I am saying is are. that the balances and the checks and balances that most democracies have, we have been slowly losing in the last decade or so. And that is what is worrying me. I'm not arguing black and white. Um, uh, and I'm certainly arguing for a, a legislated federal charter of rights that I think could help build some greater trust in, in Parliament when it passes laws that explicitly, what do you do when the majority in Parliament, coupled with the opposition, agree to laws that are in breach of our fundamental rights. What happens then? What do you do when you have a Parliament that uh, is above the law or appears to be above the law because there's no way of controlling it? The courts can't, the public service can't, um, and there's nowhere else to go. In other words, if Parliament's passed the law, that's the end of the matter. Now, if Parliament were acting according to the usual, what's called legislative restraint, historically, they would always presume uh, that laws did not impinge upon our common law freedoms. There was a presumption that Australian uh, laws and that Parliament always intended to abide by the principles of international law. Those principles have simply disappeared, and Parliament now has a carte blanche to do pretty much exactly as it wants, including passing laws, which in my view, and in the views of, of many others, including uh, judges and other parliamentarians, are egregiously in breach of the fundamental principles of law that this country was built on. And that is what worries me. Can I respond to that? I can see that I'm going to be completely superfluous. No, 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 no you're not. <laughs> uh, in the first place, Parliament is not above the law. It makes the law. It makes the law because it has the democratic title to make the law. And that is the system that we established at Federation. It was Indeed. the system before Federation. And it has been the system going back into British tradition for a very long time. So the idea that this is this, this new idea <coughs> 
that Parliament is suddenly trampling on rights and asserting a position that it doesn't have is completely wrong. That's not trampling, it's called democracy. The second thing I'd say is, I hope to God that Parliament frequently overrules the common law. Because the common law, as well as all these wonderful things that Gillian has said, has in other parts been one of the most oppressive and unpleasant systems of law until it was reformed by Parliament. Now, some of you, it's just possible, may be Labor voters. And some of you may, in the depths of your bowels, believe in trade unions. Are you aware that trade unions, as combinations in restraint of trade, were illegal at common law? And that wicked parliament stopped that. Were you aware that in all sorts of punishments, some of the more interesting ones, like pressing to death, they were valid at common law. And it was parliaments who intervened to stop it. Now, no one's going to say that parliaments are perfect. And I, I have to say, I served for two years as the director of a parliamentary committee in Victoria, so I have a reasonable idea of how they work. It was the, among other things, it did scrutiny of regulations and it did a pretty good job. But honestly, this picture we're painting of an utterly supine parliament, as I say, a few years ago, I would have had more sympathy for this argument because it would have had a tenuous grip on reality. Now, during this last 10 years, I've been a vice chancellor of a university, which most universities are completely dependent upon the government for money. So basically, we've been relying on legislation going through Parliament unamended in the proper way that I've drafted it for whatever Minister of Education happens to be in power at the time. And we have had to deal with Senates where they didn't have a majority, House of Representatives where they didn't have a majority, Parliaments that were completely unstable with difficult people who had their own minds about what they were going to do. And the fact that a parliamentary committee doesn't agree with me or doesn't agree with Gillian or has members which disagree with each other is not necessarily a bad thing. So as I say, it's funny, this is the weakest this argument could ever have been put at at any time I can think of back to the time of Federation. Well, can I suggest to you... <laughs> when you suggest that Australia is this wonderful paradise for human rights... No, I didn't say that. I actually said it had the you, average sort of problems you of might, a liberal democracy that wasn't doing that You bad. might go to Manus Island. You might go to Nauru. You might go to any one of Australia's mainland detention centres and Christmas Island and visit those people in these conditions. I have... Had, I have been to all of those detention centres. I've been to Christmas Island three times. I have seen children held in detention for a year without education. I've seen people without medical care in desperate need for that care. And, and uh, the argument appears to be that Parliament can make those laws that allow these inhumane uh, and cruel policies. And I say that is inconsistent with Australian law and it is inconsistent with our international legal which, obligations, which we which, barely... Which bit of Australian law is inconsistent? Well, one an interesting one is, uh, is Comcare, the Comcare legislation. Um, so how, uh, is, how is it inconsistent? And we also have... How, how is it inconsistent The rights of the child. We have much legislation in relation to the care of children, uh, or the right of children to education. So that is have, absolutely fundamental so in Australian we have, law. we have later legislation passed by a democratic parliament which to that extent has amended the legislation that you are talking about, even assuming for the moment that the two pieces of legislation are on the same field, which is the only way they can be consistent, the fact is Parliament has control over its own legislation. It's impossible to say that one act of Parliament has contravened another act of Parliament. It may have impliedly amended it, but the point is this, let me take... Hard it has breached our international obligations I and our common care law principles. Whether it's well, I'm sorry, but you see, you make my point for the purpose of the argument you make my point. of whether mm. or not it has breached Australian law. International law is another question altogether. But let, let me take the hard part. I'm not a great enthusiast for Manus uh, or a great enthusiast for Chris Island. I'm pretty sure you would have a fair idea that that's the case. However, I will take the hard point. If the democratically elected Australian Parliament, which goes to the polls every three years, decides as a matter of legislative policy 
that is going to have a particular law about migration, then I may disagree with it, but it is the law. And I am not going to go to another system where we say, well, we don't like that, and therefore we're going to abandon the concept of parliamentary democracy, and that's the problem you've got. I'm going to assert what little authority I have remaining. <laughs> and I'm going to open things up. They answered essentially my list of questions in their conversation. <laughs> so I'm going to open things up to you. So if, um, just a couple of things about asking a question. One, ideally it would be a question and not a comment. And I reserve the right to interrupt you to tell you to ask a question rather than make a comment. Um, but also if, when you, introduce, if you, when you ask a question, if you would wait for the microphone because this is being recorded. It's being recorded by SBS, by RN, by La Trobe. Uh, if you ask a f an efficient question, your question might get on TV. Uh, and <laughs> if you would say briefly who you are and ask your question, that would be wonderful and wait for a microphone. Yes, well, there's one down the front here. Hello, thanks for the great talk. Uh, my name's Angus, I'm an engineering student at RMIT. Uh, my question's for Professor Triggs. Uh, you've been quoted as saying, we are increasingly out of step with comparable legal systems in Britain, Europe, etc." His comparison seems to me to be an oversimplification because uh, the British tradition of common law and the lack of a written British constitution stands in stark contrast to the abstract and idealistic approach to the constitutional rights uh, that is taken on the continent. Its difference is significant enough to be cited as a key motivator for the British exit of the European Union. Now my question is, is the European Court of Human Rights not a clear example of the threat high courts uh, pose to common law and the supremacy of parliament? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Of course, it's a very pertinent one in the context of the um, of the, the, the Brexit uh, that seems to be uh, uh, very likely uh, with, with no deal. Um, and you're right to say, although it's somewhat confusing, it's somewhat, it, it's, you're right to say that the concerns about the impact of the European Court of Human Rights have been one of the elements that led to the Brexit vote. Um, in fact, they're different things. Um, leaving Brexit is not going to mean leaving the European Court of Human Rights, but we'll put that to one side because it's a legal technicality, if you like. But, the, but it's fueled the sense in Britain uh, that to have a European court uh, explain what equality means, what equality before the law is, um, what, um, what abortion rights might be, what the rights of prisoners are to fair trial uh, and to access to information and so on, uh, and the right to vote, for example. All of these matters have been considered by the European Court of Human Rights, and they've done so on the basis of a convention that Britain has signed. But because of the way the Council of Europe works, uh, the uh, decisions of the European Court are uh, uh, directives to the British system, and they must abide by those basic directives. Now, in, on, on almost all of them, um, Britain's pretty well there anyway. I mean, there's, no, there's very little difference. But there is, a, there is an ideological or political concern about a, a, a foreign court, if you like, a court to which the government's agreed, but nonetheless one that has an impact on domestic law. Um, and that, that, that offends people. Um, the, I, the, the European vision of a, of a supranational body is something that's, that's very advanced jurisprudence, it's very advanced thinking, and it's not something that everybody agrees with. Um, however, that's what the, they've agreed to. We have nothing comparable in our part of the world. Um, most every region of the world has some form of regional court. The Inter-American Court of Justice, the Africans uh, the, 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 in, the, in the Middle East. We have nothing in the Asia-Pacific region at all, and we don't have any sort of um, common view as to what the law is. Europe did have, and so they were prepared to embark on this experiment. Um, I see the European Court as providing very advanced jurisprudence, um, but it also mirrors to a high degree the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, and, of course, the individual courts of Canada, New Zealand, um, uh, Britain um, and, and some other countries in Europe. So what I'm suggesting is that Australia is falling behind in the development of that jurisprudence. Um, an example would be marriage equality as an example of, ma of equality before the law. And now you may disagree with that view, you may disagree with that jurisprudence, but my point technically is, 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 is accurate. We are not keeping up with that developing jurisprudence in the whole of, 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 of Europe and, and North, of North America. You may say, well, I don't like that jurisprudence, so it's not a problem. 
I suggest that that jurisprudence is helpful, um, and that's why I gave you a little bit of a quote from the, the Belmarsh case, where holding people on suspicion without charge or trial and holding them indefinitely um, is a breach of fundamental human rights, whether they're developed at the common law in Britain or whether they're developed in the European Court of Human Rights. And we hold people without charge or trial uh, on the basis of parliamentary legislation. That would be overturned if we had a charter of rights, just as holding juveniles in adult facilities will be overturned if you've got a charter of rights. And there are many, many other examples. Um, now, if you don't like that evolving jurisprudence, that's a matter of, matter of your own view. But I think I'm still justified in making my point uh, that we are, we are slipping behind into a weird form of isolationism. If you go to New, Ze uh, New Zealand, you will see uh, this embracing of, of, their, of the Maori people, of their um, extraordinary approach to ensuring um, access to social justice, to housing, dealing with social problems, because in part, not totally, but in part because they have this overarching um, charter of human rights that informs government decision-making. And in, indeed, most matters are resolved before they ever get to a court. Because when you've got a charter in place, that informs what the parliament's going to do, it informs what the community expects, and the very, very few matters ever go uh, to the courts in New Zealand, uh, because, not because they aren't occasionally in breach of the law, but, but because they're usually resolved at the government, at parliamentary and community levels. Greg, did you want to add anything? Um, look, I'm, I... I, I won't take up the particular point about Brexit. I think there's this weird contradiction, though. So, Julian's sitting there and she's just told us how judges are immensely restrained people and never run amok and there's no danger of terms in charters that they will uh, do broadly and have major effects and, you know, they're not going to sort of do it. And she's just listed for us a whole lot of fundamental things that if we had a charter, she means a bill, if we had a Bill of Rights, I mean would, it would immediately be overruled by the courts. So the courts are simultaneously restrained. They're not going to act as a super legislature, but they're going to do all of these quite amazing things which will overrule whole lots of forms of legislation in whole areas of policy. You really can't have it both way. The judges can't be restrained and yet incredibly Herculean in what they do. The second thing I think that's funny about this is, and I think you use the word three or four times, advanced. And I think this is this peculiar idea, as I say, that yeah, we're tucked down here in this corner of the world and we, we actually never discovered computers. In, in fact, we never really discovered the wheel. We're, we're so uncivilised that we haven't been properly exposed to right and advanced thinking uh, in Europe. Uh, I don't get that. And I don't get the idea that just because Australia is different to Europe uh, or different to America, and thank Christ we're different to America uh, with their Bill of Rights, it means that we are in some way demeaned or primitive. I mean, the thing I always think about uh, with these things is compulsory voting. Compulsory voting, I think, is very rare around the world. We have it in Australia, and I think it's one of the best things that we've got. Now, in terms of same-sex marriage, that's a, it's an interesting one. Um, my view on same-sex marriage, so I have all sorts of, of different views, but I can tell you I have a gay brother and a gay son. Uh, I loathed the plebiscite, by the way, and did everything I could to stop it. Uh, I am immensely relieved that if we were to have same-sex marriage, it was brought in by a democratically elected parliament with all the authority that that parliament had and then went into the Australian people rather than being imposed by a group of unelected judges. And I think that would have been a very bad thing uh, for anyone who supports same-sex marriage. Well, I'm delighted, Greg, that we agree on one thing, and that is compulsory <laughs> voting. Yes. Well, it has to be one thing on the law of averages. <laughs> one Not same-sex marriage? Um, the, the, um, Probably complicated. Uh, to, to put such a rosy view of the way in which our parliament acted on marriage equality is little short of disgraceful. <laughs> I, can, I can think of no other word. <laughs> it, it was a parliamentary disgrace, and we managed to slither through it, and the Australian public voted for the right outcome and the government was forced to go through that. Well, 
process. We, to uh, describe that as a triumph for the parliamentary democracy is, in my right. view, absolute rubbish. We actually agree on two things. Two things. Uh, <laughs> the thing we agree on, I think, is I have no doubt that the process was revolting. As I said, I was completely opposed to the plebiscite. Um, and I made that view very, very clear to both the Prime Ministers who put it. I wasn't saying that it was a triumph of parliamentary process. Anything that has a plebiscite... You imply which I don't, I'm, No, I'll tell you what I'm saying rather than what you're implying. Uh, what I have said in the past and written, and you can look this up, is that plebiscites are the pornography of democracy. They're absolutely disastrous. What I did say is that if you wanted to have same-sex marriage, and you wanted it secure, and you wanted it accepted, and you wanted it to subsist free of the sort of attacks that can be made on it that are not very nice, then having it voted through a democratically elected parliament, no matter how bad the preceding process, is vastly better than having it dreamt up and put in by three judges. All right. More questions. There's another one here. Thank you. Uh... My question is for Professor Craven. Um, you've characterised Professor Gillians as being an uh, activist in her motivations. And my question is, what's so bad about that? Because uh, historically, the people that have stood out in politics and lawmaking are usually either very bad people or activists in their um, aims. Um, Another question I had for you was, obviously, you value, you know, the political process a lot. Um, and you talked about the Manus Islands and the detaining of uh, immigrants. And you talked about how if that is a law that's been passed, you wouldn't object to it. Um, but I guess, obviously, it's low-hanging fruit, but the Holocaust was legal. And numerous human rights abuses all over the world have been legal in different times and different places. So is civil obedience really more important than doing the right thing? I think he's on... I think, <clears throat> I think he's on your side, but I like him a lot. Um, the first question that you asked basically confuses politics and law. Uh, so you basically take the proposition that you have a particular view of politics, which is progressive, uh, that it is objectively right, because you believe it, uh, and because you believe it, you are entitled to enshrine it in law, uh, in a Bill of Rights, which will bind everyone. Uh, you have real problems, legally. Uh, you are not entitled, simply because you're progressive, to assume that that's right. You are not entitled to impose that view through unelected judges. My strong advice to you would be to stand for election get yourself elected with a number of like-minded people and then pass a law. Uh, what you're actually doing is you're helping me a lot, and that's why I like you, because you're really bringing out, I think, the full implications uh, of what Julian said. You are right in one sense. I've looked at a lot of bills of rights. I mean, we could probably both carpet the floors of our houses with bills of rights. I have never seen a bill of rights uh, interpreted by a judiciary free to interpret it. Remember the Soviet Union uh, had uh, a Bill of Rights that didn't help anyone terribly much. I have never seen a Western Bill of Rights that has not been interpreted progressively. It's like night follows day. That's why progressivists like you, and I congratulate you on your honesty, like these things so much. Because you are absolutely convinced, rightly, that the progressivist judges that you select will do the right thing, uh, and rather than interpret it necessarily according to law, and certainly not according to conservatism, will do it progressively. So if your case is basically political, you've just proved my point. You're, you're not a Democrat. Now, I've debated in a lot of teams. One of the rules is that the first person to mention the Holocaust loses the debate. So, uh, no, I disown you. You're no longer on my side of the debate. You're on Gillian's side. <laughs> Um, there is no possible comparison between the Holocaust and Nazi Germany and Australia today. And as I say, anybody, anybody who thinks that, I think probably needs Xanax rather than a copy of the Constitution. There isn't. But it's interesting the way you slide your argument around. So one of the things you said was, well, of course, what you've just said is if Parliament has uh, legislation around things like Manus, then you have no objection to that legislation and. Of course I have objection to what is being done there. Of course I don't 
like it. And of course, if I were Prime Minister, and God help all of us, I never will be Prime Minister, I would try and repeal that legislation. What I do maintain is that if the legislation is democratically enacted, then that is the law. And there simply isn't a choice between saying, well, we're a bit of a democracy, but we're not a democracy if you don't like it, or if Julian doesn't like it, or I don't like it. So there's a big difference between saying you uphold democratic parliamentary authority and saying you therefore automatically uphold every single piece of legislation as a good idea. I'm sure that half the legislation on the statute books I don't like, and the other half Gillian doesn't like, so we're again on a unity ticket here. But uh, I just don't think you can say that. Julian, do you want to add? No, I won't add to that. There's one there. Yep. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Hi, my name's Deborah. I'm a doctor, not a lawyer, so excuse my um, ignorance around the legal frameworks that you've talked about. I guess my question is to both of you, but it particularly revolves around the concept of, you know, uh, um, upholding our democracy and allowing Parliament to make decisions, and the fact that in three years' time we can unelect a government if they don't make decisions that the majority are happy with. My concern is for the minorities in our community exactly. who will never have the voice that's loud enough to be able to influence the decisions and protect their rights when potentially they're being trampled. And I wonder why can't there be a combination of um, charters of rights that ensure that those who will never have the majority voice in our communities are protected um, at the same time as having a parliament that legislates. Uh, perhaps you can enlighten me on how we might move forward with that. You can go first on that, I think. It's always, it's, it's always going to be a challenge um, in any democracy, including Australia, to make sure that minority rights are protected because obviously um, it's not the case that governments are going to be voted into office by minorities. Uh, although they may be voted into office by combinations of minorities. Uh, I don't think it's the case, as some people suggest, that uh, every single minority in Australia is ruthlessly persecuted by parliaments. Uh, and I think if you go back over the statute books, uh, you will find lots of legislation by parliaments that actually protect minorities. Uh, and one example was the atrociously passed, but nevertheless valid piece of legislation around same-sex marriage. At the end of the day, that particular minority was protected uh, by parliamentary legislation. There's parliamentary legislation that protects people with all sorts of physical disabilities. There's parliamentary legislation in Equal Opportunity Acts, some of which I wrote myself, which protect against discrimination, all sorts of people. Um, you know, as I say, in Gillian's book, she goes through in you know, some detail and perfectly fair to her, that sort of parliamentary legislation. Now, you're always going to get minorities who want something and who are not going to get it, and they will conceive it as a right. They may be right or they may be wrong. Uh, the question is, how do you come up with a system that deals with that? And you've got a choice. You've got a choice where you can have a broadly enacted human rights uh, bill of rights uh, and the judges will make up their mind and it will not be democratic and you're going to have to accept that uh, or you can have a democratic system which is imperfect and may sometimes get it wrong but as I said also often gets it right but you're going to have to choose and in choosing between a bill of rights and democracy you're going to have to face all of those problems that I said before. You're going to have to explain how this is democratic. You're going to have to explain what happens when the judges get it wrong. Because judges don't always get decisions about minorities right either. You're going to have to explain uh, what you're going to do when you can never change those decisions of the judges. So there is no, I think, easy answer for that sort of thing. Uh, for me, it comes down to something fundamental you're either in favour of democracy and working with democracy and trying to get it to work, and there are lots of arguments about minorities where that's happened, uh, or you're in favour of a system where you opt out of democracy and you give it to a group of unelected people and you assume, you assume that they're going to protect minorities. 
even though they are appointed by the same executive government that is the product of the parliament that you have such troubles with. I mean, I used to say to my law students, and St Julian no longer has to worry about this, but, um, you know, they'd say, we want a Bill of Rights. And why? Because the High Court judges, they're wonderful people, they'll protect minorities, they'll do these great things. And I said, do you know what a High Court judge looks like? Notwithstanding, we now have three women for a small number of years. Uh, and they'd say, no. And I said, well, look at me. I'm white. I'm male. I'm Anglo-Saxon. I went to a good private school. I was educated at the University of Melbourne by Julia. So you think that I would be able to make these decisions with six of my brethren, utterly unaccountable, and that's a better system than democracy. I don't buy it. Gillian. Well, I think a, 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 one of the critical elements of our representative constitutional democracy uh, is that we avoid the tyranny of the majority. It's a critical feature that we respect the rights and interests of a minority, of the, and whatever those minority groups are. Of course, in Australia, we're talking about, in part, 3% uh, of the population being Indigenous Australians. Um, I'm not talking about political power. I'm talking about recognising the individual rights of every person in Australia. And when you understand that protecting human rights is not always a pleasant thing. There were certainly occasions, and Senate Estimates had a lovely time criticising me for it, but there are occasions when even a criminal has human rights. Uh, the lowliest per outcast of, in the community has some rights. Uh, the most powerless and vulnerable people in our community have rights whether we're talking about aged Australians or people with disabilities. Over and over again, I'd have to say, my work at the Human Rights Commission demonstrated that no matter what you're talking about, race, um, indigenous, sexual harassment, the people most likely to be affected and, and uh, hurt are those people with disabilities. It's a shocking phenomenon because it reflects the lack of control. But the point I'm making is that one of the values that stands behind our constitutional democracy is that we do not have a tyranny of, ma of the majority and that we protect the individual freedoms and rights of each person. And we lose sight of that. It's not about political majorities. It's about a system with a political majority that respects and honours the rights of every citizen in the country. Thanks, Gillian. We probably have time for one more question and there's one just in the middle there. Thank you um, <coughs> for the uh, very entertaining debate. Uh, my question uh, will be uh, for Professor Craven. Um, you briefly touched upon the non-represent... Uh, firstly, uh, my name is Anka. I'm a migration law professional. Um, and um, my question, um, you briefly touched upon when um, you mentioned uh, the non-representative nature of the High Court. And um, uh, by extension, uh, you implied that uh, the parliament is slightly better representative of the population at large, but nowhere near as, um, as, um, uh, as diverse as, as our population is in Australia. We often hear that um, one out of every four Australians um, was born outside Australia, and that one out of two uh, Australians has a parent born outside Australia. And um, we have a situation with uh, the High Court's interpretation of uh, Section 44 of the Constitution, whereby um, uh, those people who are, are either double, uh, dual citizens or have the right to dual citizenship are unable to stand for Parliament. Um, and I would um, put it to you that probably half the people in this room would be unable or ineligible to stand for the Australian Parliament. That includes myself. Um, I. Again, reading between the lines, you, um, uh, I believe you believe in the Australian people to, um, uh, to make um, good decisions if uh, the question was put to them in a referendum, as Section 44 would have to be. Uh, I share your optimism, I share your belief in the Australian people. My question to you, uh, Professor Craven, um, and I know I'm asking this in the context of neither of the major part, two parties um, having a commitment to uh, making any change to or putting to the Australian people 
um, any proposal for a change of Section 44 of the Constitution, which effectively means up to half the people in Australia are unable to um, stand for Parliament. Do you believe that um, there is a solution to this issue? Do you believe that um, were it to be put to a referendum, uh, whether it would um, actually get up? I, I certainly believe it does, but, um, but I, I, I want to hear what you think. Thank you. Well, I certainly stand by the proposition that the Australian Parliament, while not perfectly representative of Australia, and no legislative body is per perfectly representative, is vastly more representative than the judges, both in terms of composition, but in terms of you know, democratic chain of title. It's very hard to be representative if no one elected you. Um, section, the Section 44 one is an, in, an interesting one. Um, what, it, what it actually shows is what happens, I guess, when judges do have power in a particular context and they can come to a decision and then it's very hard to go around it uh, unless you have a referendum. And I would say to all of you in relation to a Bill of Rights, you, know, you do have that open to. If you are so convinced, like my colleague there, that the whole world wants a Bill of Rights, and uh, they all want a Bill of Rights that's progressive, then it's really easy. Just get one party uh, to put a Bill of Rights up to referendum and see what happens. I don't see any enthusiasm for that, and I think I know why. Um, it's interesting with Section 44, actually. Um, I was never sure the High Court would make that decision because I thought that, frankly, the decision that it came to would prove inconvenient to the High Court because it would become the perpetual court of disputed returns. So I might have been somewhat cowardly and, and got off that. I think it's a really interesting question whether or not it would win at a referendum. Um, I'm not sure because I'm an expert on one thing and that is losing referenda. Uh, I was Malcolm Turnbull's deputy on the Yes Committee that saddled you with Queen Camilla. So I know all about how to lose referenda. And referenda are very, very easy to lose. It's one of the reasons a Bill of Rights would lose, not only because it's wrong, but because it would be quite easy to defeat. Um, and the challenge, I think, for a Section 44 referendum would be, for example, do you know what the strongest argument against a republic was, as far as we could tell? The strongest argument was put was that we would be thrown out of the Commonwealth if we were a republic. Now, the majority of countries in the <coughs> Commonwealth are republics, so that's complete rubbish. But people were really frightened. Why were they frightened of being thrown out of the Commonwealth? I mean, I don't think anybody in this room probably cares about the Commonwealth. Well, the answer is the Commonwealth Games. If we weren't in the Commonwealth, we couldn't be in the Commonwealth Games. In the Olympics, we have to play Russia and America, and we lose. In the Commonwealth Games, we have get to play Jamaica and Belize, and we win. And that really affected people. Now, the question, the, re the reason I say that is because you can get some really silly arguments that get traction. I think the argument that would be put in a Section 44 referendum by the sort of people who would oppose it would probably be um, vote for the ISIS terrorist in Parliament. That would be the no case. I know no cases very well because I've been mugged by one. Um, and the question would be, you know, how would people react to that type of thing? Now, you know, I would defend the result if the result went, and I have my own view of how it would go, if the result went against the way I went, because that is indeed the constitutional and legal process we have to change the constitution. I mean, both of us know that 44 out of 44 referenda, 36 have failed. 30 of them not because they didn't get a majority of states, but because they didn't get a majority of people. Well, that is really called, that, it, that really is democracy. That's hard, ugly democracy staring you in the face. And it's very hard to say, well, no, we're not going to do that. So I, I, I couldn't actually predict. I mean, having gone through the Republican referendum and still bearing the scars of it, uh, I think it would be interesting to see how that one would go. Julian? Um, I am I'm certainly concerned by the undemocratic situation in which we currently are. Um, I suspect more than half of us have a foreign-born parent or grandparent, 
And for many, many nations, that means that we would be entitled to ask for uh, um, nationality of that other country. So I think that what it's done is, um, is uh, effectively uh, prevent uh, something like half the Australian population from ever standing from Parliament to, to, for Parliament. And I think that's an extraordinary position to be in. Uh, but for all the reasons Greg set, set out, uh, getting a referendum through to change that will be exceptionally hard to achieve. And um, who knows? This is one of the great difficulties we have to face in Australia. The, the extreme difficulty of changing that constitution that does not protect our rights uh, and the extreme difficulty of managing a parliament that also uh, all too often does not protect those basic rights. And that's the challenge that we have to have to discuss, and I would like to see more debates of this kind, uh, so that we can refute the kinds of arguments that Greg is mating, making, most of which are inaccurate or uh, muddled uh, arguments that, that do not reflect the reality of the way in which the law develops and the power of the courts. Um, should I point out, I should point out too, that our judges are appointed by elected representatives. Well, actually, they're not. They're it, appointed by the executive. But on the advice of, of, uh, of the government. So, I mean, we know who our High Court judges are because they're appointed by senior politicians it, it, indirectly, I mean, technically through the Executive yeah. Council, but, uh, but in fact, through our elected representatives. Yeah. So it's a little misleading to say that all our judges are, are white, middle-class uh, Anglo-Saxons who know nothing about the world. That's really a ridiculous proposition. Yes. No, just, and just, I think just, we have been in, inordinately good... Uh, inordinately fortunate in Australia to have the calibre of judges that we have. That doesn't deal with the point, though. Judges would have a capacity to interpret these, these vessels that, that, uh, that Greg talks about, and that's, that's a fair argument. Um, except that he completely ignores decades of jurisprudence, decades of evolving law that explains what these terms actually mean. So it's, it's grossly misleading to describe it as an empty vessel. These are words that have had meaning uh, for millennia. Uh, and they've had meaning because courts have given it to them, parliaments have given meaning to those words, and that is, has, uh, provides the precedent basis on which any judge would try to reach a determination as to what these terms mean. Equality before the law. Uh, how do you protect, and, the, and the, the lady asked this very important question, how do you protect minorities? In Australia, you will know that the Liberal Democratic Party passed laws uh, for the uh, intervention in the Northern Territory. And in order to do it under our existing laws, had to um, stand down uh, the operability of the Racial Discrimination Act. The only way they could do it was by, by, um, by, by uh, taking out of consideration the racial discrimination legislation. And that is done by the federal parliament and its laws. Uh, the, the Racial Discrimination Act has now been uh, re-applicable, uh, re but nonetheless, we still have uh, ex an extraordinary situation in the Northern Territory uh, where the, the autonomy uh, of our indigenous peoples has been, has been subsumed and we have things like debit cards and, and so on, uh, welfare cards that, that diminish their capacity for autonomy. Um, these, are, these are serious questions in Australia and I'm really distressed if, if the outcome of this debate is that we're both at polarised points of view. Um, we've both put our arguments, I think, as strongly as we can. Um, <laughs> And, 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 of course, Greg is, is, is wonderful in the way he makes some of these arguments because arguments very often have a, have a germ of truth. There's a little bit of truth in just about everything that Greg has said, but it's misleading and confusing because it's failed to understand the core arguments. And I would like to see more debates of this kind that, that, that bring together a better understanding of what we're dealing with in, in the centre of the arguments and not, and not the sort of extreme positions um, uh, that, that I think uh, perhaps have been taken tonight. Um, these are serious questions for the Australian public to consider, and I think if we can talk about what, how we want to resolve these problems, if we resolve them through parliamentary scrutiny committees, uh, through parliamentary processes, then I will retire from the debate about a charter. I am not talking about a Bill of Rights, and I will not be um, placed in the position uh, of of, of uh, putting that view. I am not arguing for constitutional change. I'm arguing for a legislated federal charter that would help to provide some guidelines. But I would very much like to see this debate continued, um, but perhaps with greater accuracy on some of the legal <laughs> and factual matters. <laughs> Thank you.
So I, I have a strong suspicion that the audience would like to see this debate continued. I'm not sure that Robert Mann really wants us to keep going because no, time go. is running out. But also, Greg Craven keeps looking at me going, I need to say something else. So, Greg, you have one minute, and then Gillian will have one minute, oh. and then we will call it quits. Yeah, I think Gillian's had about six minutes, so I'm happy to take one minute. Um, I'm sure there are a number of law students in this audience. I don't think you do Latin maxims anymore. We used to. Uh, the Latin term for what Gillian is talking is rot. Uh, it's a very evocative Latin term. Uh, take an example. Members of Parliament appoint judges. They do not. Members of Parliament who have actually been commissioned as members of the executive appoint judges, and they can appoint effectively whoever they like, <coughs> and they can make sure that those judges are suitable for the interpretation of the Bill of Rights. Uh, I noticed that Gillian, <laughs> towards the end of the debate, started to wriggle away from the Bill of Rights, even though occasionally she talked about the Bill of Rights herself. We know, of course, that Gillian's legal uh, analysis of this is so sophisticated that we didn't even have the Mumilic case in the index. We did, in fact, have Sean Mikulov, Australia's 72nd most funny comedian. But we didn't actually have the case that says Gillian's dialogue model is unconstitutional. So, as I say, it's the Volkswagen debate. You're being offered something that won't work, that can't be done, that will have all sorts of problems, and basically half of the problems are sort of admitted. On the one hand, the judges are not going to do anything. On the other hand, they're going to be all conquering heroes. Um, I don't accept that this is a debate where you know, I've been trying to mislead you or trick you. Uh, I don't think it's my job to try and mislead and trick you. Uh, I do think this stuff about being demeaning is condescending. Uh, I think it's condescending to anyone who takes this particular side of the debate. I think it's condescending to any one of the Australian people in the electorate who are entirely titled to that type of debate. Uh, but I think we need to be quite clear what we're talking about. We are talking about suspending a fundamental element of parliamentary elected democracy in favour of a judicial club of heroes, and nothing changes that. Gillian. Well, I'm going to use my last few seconds to say um, I'm really pleased to be here tonight because this is really the last time for a few years that I'm going to be as outspoken as I have been this evening because I'm just about to take on a United Nations role. And in that, for that reason, I will morph from being an Australian citizen to an international public servant. And I will no longer be able to make the kinds of remarks that I've made tonight. So I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope that this debate can keep on going. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. So <laughs> just before we finish and you all depart, I just need to say a few thank yous. So just remain. Uh, first of all, a thank you to everybody at La Trobe for putting this together. There are people in marketing and people in technical roles who do a lot of work behind the scenes. Robert Mann, who is so active in and has this ongoing commitment to public debate in Australia that allows these conversations to flourish. To all of you for coming and for paying attention, because without you, we can't have these conversations. Obviously, to our two speakers who have been thought-provoking and provoking uh, in a range of ways. Um, and before you leave, there are two more events coming up in September, one on climate change. Um, and you can see it includes Bob Brown, David Ritter, Amanda Cahill, and Maisha Moyne, and one on the kinds of drinkers that you are. So um, I leave it up to you where you would prefer to have a think about yourself, your sustainability commitments or your drinking commitments, um, but perhaps you could bring both of them along. So again, thank you all for coming and thank you very much to Greg and Gillian.